Good afternoon, Patriots. This is the American Vision broadcast on the TLB TV network and brought to you by and sponsored by the Liberty Beacon Project. I'm your host, Bill Muckler, and today I'm super excited to have a fantastic guest, Raquel Oki. And Raquel is uh, coming to us from uh, Port Ritchie, Florida on the um, on the Gulf Coast, and I'm coming to you from uh, Cocoa, uh, Florida, on the uh, Atlantic coast of Florida. So this is an all-Florida show today. And uh, to introduce uh, Raquel, uh, she's originally from New York. Uh, she's from, um, graduated from St. John's University in New York and has uh, uh, written a lot of articles. I've read her articles. They're just fantastic. And she's about to uh, publish a book uh, soon to be published. And so Raquel, welcome to the show and uh, tell us a little bit about yourself. Thank you, Bill. I'm so happy to be here as well. Um, like you said, I was, born, I was born and raised in New York, Queens County. I'm a New York City girl. And I went to St. John's University. I studied criminal justice. And after I graduated from St. John's, I got to work working for civil litigators in New York City. And I did that for about 10 years. Um, and I made really good money, by the way, doing it. So I made a living off being a legal secretary and a paralegal, and uh, it helped me pay my bills and raise my children and so on. I didn't get to tell you this earlier, Bill, but I was a teen mom. I was a teen mom. And when I had my son, uh, when I was 17 years old, I was also a, um, a young bride, a young bride, a shotgun wedding. And um, at that time, you know, people were really... So some people were kind of angry. They're kind of like, how could you be so young and be having a child? You're going to be ruining your life. You're never going to amount to anything. You're, you know, you're throwing your life away. And I never really understood why deciding to have a baby, you know, at that age would mean that all of a sudden my life was over. And I made a very hard decision. I made a decision back then that not only was I going to be the best mother that I could be, but I was also going to retain my life, that I could do both. And I wanted to prove everybody wrong. And I worked really hard to do that. And it took me seven years to graduate St. John's University. Um, after that, I, you know, proceeded to work for a living. I really got involved in, in the um, pro-life movement in New York City with a group called Helpers of God's Precious Infants. And that was the catapult to me getting involved in politics and the Conservative Party of New York. And the Conservative Party of New York asked me to run as their candidate for New York City Council in 2005. Yeah. That's what I did. I ran for New York City Council and I got 14% of the vote, which was very, very high. Um, the number of the, the percentages of Conservative Party voters in New York City is very small. And uh, they, they average, candidates average about 3%. So when I received 14% of the vote in that election, uh, the, the party was very, very happy. We were very, very happy about it. And after that, that it really catapulted like my political career. I became involved with the, um, the Young Republican Club of Manhattan. I became an executive committee member. I also was an elected official in the conservative party. Um, I also acted as their um, uh, press person, uh, media person, uh, started writing press releases, things like that for the Conservative Party. And I started my own blog, RaquelOki.com. And I just started writing. And I just would get home at night, put the kids to bed, you know, do, make dinner, do the dishes, put the kids to bed, and get on the computer and just blog. And I'm blogging, blogging, blogging all these stories which really was, gave me a name in New York City when it came to politics. And because I was attending all of these events, political events in New York, after it was all over, I go home and, <laughs> and everybody wants to know, what's your cow gonna say now? <laughs> yeah. like, oh, because you know, I'm very explicit. I'm not, you know, unafraid, explicit. So. I'd go back to my computer, this politician did this wrong, and this, this <laughs> party lied about this, and you know, it was really provocative. And um, that blog became really popular. 
I ended up, I moved, I got, I got met, I had been divorced um, since I was 25 years old. And then I got remarried in my late 30s. And when I got remarried, I started a new website called Raquel Okiai, which is my married name. And I moved to Ulster County, New York, upstate New York, about 90 miles north of New York City. And when I moved to Ulster County, I started a tea party called Ulster, Ulster Orange Tea Party. So it combined the two counties, Ulster County and Orange County. Mm -hmm. And that tea party became so popular that we had candidates across the state at local levels, governor levels, congressional candidates, house candidates, senatorial candidates, wanting to come speak to my group. So we started having monthly meetings and at those monthly meetings, we would invite speakers and those speakers would be candidates, reporters, ad ad activists, anybody who had something to say that they wanted to get out to the public and they were being, they weren't able to get it out through the press. So they came to my tea party. Once that, I did that for two full years, meetings every month. So we started off in a diner with six people and we ended up, a, a lady had volunteered, she became my, my co-coordinator actually, um, Lorraine Morano from Ulster County. And uh, she volunteered to have her host, to host our tea parties at her, in her own home. So we, we're having very, a very sophisticated get together, people in three piece suits, <laughs> and, and, you know, um, I mean, it was so sophisticated. Um, I had uh, so many people there, uh, Rick Lazio, who had run for governor as a guest. Um, oh, gosh, I can't even remember. I had so many local candidates, the sheriff, I had the DA, I had, you know, everybody and anybody who had any kind of influence in politics wanted to be at my tea party. So that became very successful. And after that, candidates in the 2010 election that's where the tea party really became mm -hmm. big. Yeah. They were, they were looking to my tea party for endorsements, but my tea party had voted that they didn't want to give endorsements. So they said, okay, Raquel, will you give me your personal endorsement? So well, I can do that. <laughs> right? <laughs> so now I'm interviewing candidates, usually in the GOP primary, because I'm a conservative. Mm -hmm. you know? So I'm interviewing candidates in, in the GOP primary and I'm choosing, choosing sides. And then I'm endorsing them in, a, in an article, an endorsement article. That year, I endorsed probably 35 candidates, many of them winning, many of them winning their elections, um, including um, Mr. Gibson. Uh, what was his first name? He's a congressman from uh, District 22, Congressional District. I had a, I, he was a Republican running in a district that could go both ways on the congressional level. Mm -hmm. um, and um, he's a great, great candidate. And uh, it was a tough, you know, we knew it was going to be a tough race. And he asked me for his endorsement. I did an interview. I endorsed him against the Democrat. We were getting closer to the, I, I think it was Chris, Chris Gibson, Con Congressman Chris Gibson. And at the, the title of my article was uh, Chris Gibson, Republican rock star, you know, something, <laughs> something like that. And then, uh, so like a, like a week or maybe like 10 days before the election, I got a call from Chris and he said, Raquel, after that interview and that article that you posted at your blog, I really, my numbers went up, my numbers went up mm. and I was one, and I'm getting, uh, and my numbers, you know, I'm, I'm, we're, we're neck and neck, me and the Democrats. I was wondering if you would write another article <laughs> before election, because I, really hoping, you know, I, you can help me. So I said, sure, I love this guy, I still do. So I wrote a second article, we timed it really nice because people have short memories. So we timed it really nice right before the election and Chris Gibson won. Day of election, bing, 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 hello. Hi, Chris, Raquel. <laughs> Thank you so much for writing that article. Very appreciative. The other thing about Chris Gibson, Congressman Chris Gibson, I think the whole world has to know is that he was, there was a, another group out there in New York State that was asking all, elect, all candidates to sign um, an agreement that they would, uh, they would subscribe to term limits, two terms, two terms mm -hmm. per cycle. And uh, Chris Gibson signed that. He was one of many, some of them didn't win, but some of them did. He was the only one that I can remember that actually lived up to that agreement that he signed. I have so much respect for him. 
So what happened after that was John Faso, a Republican, he ran because Chris Gibson did not run again after two years, just like he agreed. And John Faso, who's a former assemblyman, um, I, I have volunteered for his campaign, very, very good, good um, congressman too. So he got elected to be a, a position last cycle. Very exciting. So while I was writing all these articles, endorsing all these candidates, that's how I got my job at Human Events. One of the senior editors there at Human Events, uh, which is a conservative news journal out of DC, they're not um, operative oper anymore. Uh, they, they sold to Town Hall. Uh, but at the time, uh, and also in the past, very po I'm sure you've heard of it, Human Events, it's Ronald Reagan's yeah. favorite newspaper. Mm -hmm. Yeah. See. So I, I got a call from Neil McCabe, who is a senior editor, award-winning journalist. And he said, you know, I saw your endorsement of David Balavia, who was a, um, a veteran running with Iraq vets for Congress. And I had endorsed him. Um, and uh, he said, I thought the article was very good. And I started looking through your blog. And I really like what I saw. So I was wondering whether you would like to write for human events. And of course I said, absolutely. <laughs> so I got brought on to human events, writing a weekly article, uh, weekly articles about the second amendment. And I was said, I told, we're going to start you off and um, we're going to give it a, you know, a little time. If you, if you produce a following, we're going to pay you. So about a month into writing or maybe six weeks into writing, I asked the Neil McCabe, who is my editor, um, whether I can start getting paid. And not only did I start getting paid, but I got retroactive, retroactive active wow. from when I started writing. And I did that for four years. I, I did not only wrote about gun, gun rights, I also was able to write about politics in general, adding two more articles a month. So I was writing six articles a month and I did that for four years. So I do have a lot of stuff published out there. But I, I have know. to thank you for that, because you found me. I've, I've, uh, I've read a lot of your articles because they're still available for people to read. And, uh, and uh, you, you've got a very uh, comprehensive and complete um, Facebook page. So if somebody goes to your Facebook page, uh, they can see all, of, all the um, links and all the activities you've been involved in. Uh, going back to when you first got started and you got 14% of the vote, that's really against all odds because uh, even even Trump got what not twenty uh, percent, I guess. And I mean, look at all the money he had in in New York. But I guess most was, most people was, don't understand that New York, the whole New York metropolitan area, is total Democrat. But then when you get out uh, upstate and out of, uh, and, and Long Island and so forth, you start getting a little bit more uh, red or purple, and so. Uh, you really, um, you really landed in the right place where you could really accomplish a lot. Well, that New York City race was really difficult, but what put me over the top with the 14% was I, I was running against John Liu. John Liu is a Democrat and he's, um, he's, he's controller now, New York City controller. Mm -hmm. And he, um, the Republicans they were, they had this like side deal with Bloomberg, who was mayor, who was running for mayor at the time, running for re-election, I think. Yes, running for re-election yeah. in 2005, the second time around. And I was not a Bloomberg fan. I didn't like him at all. So when I met with my district leader, and I wasn't GOP, I was always just, I registered 18 as independents, not really understanding that independence was actually a party. Uh, but I, I ended up, um, you know, registering conservative party and I was a conservative for a long time. Um, so when I met with my GOP leader and I asked them for, to, for them to support me, um, they, uh, the first thing out of their ma her mouth was, are you going to support Mayor Bloomberg? And I said, absolutely not. And that was, <laughs> that was it. <laughs> so, uh, fast lesson in politics. <laughs> very well, fast. She was like, all right, I got to go. I was like, boom, she ran out of the restaurant. You know, she had more than nothing to do with me. So the Republicans didn't have a candidate. So the only two people running in for the city council seat was the Democrat, John Liu, 
the incumbent, and me. So I wanted to debate John. I wanted to get me and John in a room, and I wanted to debate him. And of course, he doesn't have to debate me. Because mm -hmm. for what? You know, it isn't really, I'm like, you know, conservative party, very, very minor party, not really having a voice. And he really didn't have to do it. But I <laughs> just praised his office. I, I, I didn't leave him alone until they said yes. Until they said yes. <laughs> so we had this awesome debate at Flushing Hall, uh, which was the, the town I was running in, uh, Flushing. Um, there probably was like 200 people there. We had New York One, the, a television station, you know, mm -hmm. watching it. And uh, we, you know, we found a moderator. It all went really great. And we, of course, we were both polar opposites on the issues, but we had a very professional, you know, he had his say, I had my say, you know, we weren't like, you know, we were absolutely disagreeing. But it wasn't hostile. It wasn't a hostile mm -hmm. thing. It was a very, very good event. And after it was all over, John Liu took me to the side and he said, Raquel, <laughs> first of all, I, wanted, I don't want you to ever give up. I want you to stay in politics. You and I disagree. You and I disagree, but you're, you're great. And, and I, just want, I just wish you the best of luck in everything that you do. And it was very sincere, and I really appreciated that from John Liu. And uh, we got on the news. I got a lot of uh, press out of it. You know, it's just, it was absolutely fantastic. And um, the night of the, the election, and I had the, I had a, the Korean community in, uh, backing me. It's sort of uh, flushing is a co Korean Chinese town. And Mayor Bloomberg wanted, I, I was trying to fight this one particular bill in New York City Council which was, um, well, actually not a bill. I was trying to fight, I, I actually fought Bloomberg and I won. And this is an interesting story, if you give me a second, Bill. I think you're gonna ahead. like this. Okay. Mayor Bloomberg and his cronies, I call them, they wanted to build in my town, Flushing, um, on Main Street, they wanted to build what I called a monstrosity. And it was called Flushing Commons. And in order to build, Flushing Commons was gonna be a huge, center for um, his um, you know, corp, big corp, bring big corporations in, big housing, big apartment buildings, you know, all this disaster. And all we had in Flushing are these real mom and pop businesses, mm -hmm. mom and pop businesses, been there for generation after generation after generation. And basically Bloomberg said, go to hell, mom and pops, we're going to kick you out and we're going to build this monstrosity. So, the, and, and most of those mom and pop businesses were owned by, a lot of them were owned by Koreans. So I went to the Korean community and I said, I'm going to fight this for you. You, you want this? They're like, no, they're killing us. We don't want to move. And they gave me all of their complaints of why Flushing Commons was simply not good for our community. I took those complaints and I became the, their spokesperson. And I started attending the town hall meetings that Bloomberg had set up for public feedback. Three meetings. Each time I went, I was very prepared with all their complaints and a team of people behind me. They're all behind me mm -hmm. waiting. And so glad that I was doing this for them because they needed a voice and they didn't speak English that well. And they, they, mm -hmm. they felt they really needed someone to just present it. So the first meeting, fine. The second meeting, fine. Third meeting, I had three men, three men, Bloomberg's cronies, I call them, in Armani suits, okay? Very sophisticated men, three men, in tears, in tears. <laughs> Let me tell you something, the, we voted that down, <laughs> down. <laughs> At Bloomberg, Fleshy Commons never was created in the mom and pop shop. They're still there. They're thriving. Everything's great. Good for you. I, 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 I've never heard that story before, but when I wrote my book, uh, my philosophy is that a small, limited government close to home is best for we the people. And it sounds like what you were doing is you were standing up for we the people against all odds again, the, the big government, because Bloomberg was all about, even though he said he was a Republican and then became a, an independent, and I guess he's a Democrat now, was still always about big 
government controlling Control. everything. Bam. I, I have another story to tell you in Ulster County that I okay. did for the people. So I was in Ulster, I had moved up to Ulster County, like I had said, after I got married, and I had uh, been, become involved in the Conservative Party. And um, I was at a meeting, a monthly meeting, and a town, I was living in the town of Platakill, and the town next to mine had their own, you know, rep on the board. And um, he said, Raquel, I got an issue in my town, and I was wondering whether you could come in and, and speak at our, um, you know, on our behalf um, at uh, these meetings that were going to be set up to question, to ask whether the town wanted to build a, like, $5 million library. And the $5 million library was going to be paid by taxes. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, you know, it was an increased tax, property tax increase. Um, it was going to be like, uh, you know, 6% on everybody, homeowner, and so on. And they were up in arms because they were like, look, we already have a library. Platticill has a library. So-and-so has a library. This one has a library. Most people are using, finding their research on in the internet anyway you know, at that time. Um, and the people really just, it, it was also during this, this time where we sort of was like an economic down tra trail, you know, uh, after o Obama was elected, you know, there were some hard times going on. Uh, so the last thing that that town wanted was a $5 million library that they're going to have to pay for for the rest of their lives. Because, you know, the cost never ends. Once the government wants to buy some, pay for something, <laughs> they say it's only going to be 10 years, and then we're going to pay it off. Of course, if that never happens, they just keep, they keep funneling the money into the library. So I said, all right, I can do it. I'll, you know, gave me the facts. What, this is the deal. This is what we want. Okay, just give me the date of the, of the meeting, the town hall meeting, and I'll be there. You bring your people. Okay. So... I, I decide to, this is what I did, Bill. This was, this was great. I loved it. So I wear a suit. I wear a black suit, like very, very conservative. Mm -hmm. I pin my hair back in a, in a tight bun. I look like a school teacher, okay? <laughs> I pin it really tight, right? Really tight, a tight bun. I got my glasses. All right, so I guess they're like, you know, 15 minutes early. I got no books, no papers, no nothing. I don't need anything. I just need me. I go, I sit, I'm then there before anybody. I go in the front, in the very, you know, it's a little hall, you know, maybe to fit about 50 to 60 people. I, and chairs are set up. And they got this whole setup. They're going to show us this $5 million library and everything else. I decide I'm going to sit in the front row on the left side, inside corner because they're going to see me, because I want to be the first person to speak, because I'm going to direct, I'm going to set the tone for this meeting. Mm -hmm. So they, the bureaucrats get up there and they say, this library is so beautiful. Oh, they said, they got a film <laughs> show, they got, they got everything. And then they say, now we are going to open it up to the public. Right? So my arm goes up. <laughs> I, they have no choice but to pick me. I'm 15 minutes early. I'm sitting there. I got no papers. I got nothing. And as soon as they lay open to the book, <laughs> yes, you, they got him to know what I have to say. <laughs> so I get up there, and the first thing out of my mouth is, this library is beautiful. I love it. I love it. But we can't afford it. We can't afford it. And I just go, I only had like, um, I probably had four minutes to talk. Mm -hmm. So I spoke really fast. When this was, when I was done, I got a standing ovation. <laughs> Bill, you know they didn't build that library. <laughs> right. I'm going to give you a standing ovation. <laughs> hey. I love it. Yeah. It was great. It was great. So this is the reason why, you know, sometimes, you know, I have a lot of people, who, you know, don't really know me, don't know my history, don't know my past. And they come, you know, like they, they want to like uh, troll me, they're trolls, you know. Mm -hmm. But I have a long history and I have so many friends because they know me. They know me from back in the day. They, they, they remember, oh, I remember you and you were, you know. And, the, you know, those are just two examples. So 
Yeah. Now I'm one one thing I want you to do is uh, in reading your articles, I was fascinated by an article about a gentleman in uh, Connecticut who was a gun owner. And uh, I think, you know, right now, you know, gun ownership is going to be a big topic uh, for the next few weeks or months or whatever. Uh, I believe his name was Tapier or Tapier. Um, could you tell us a story about him? And, and I understand there's a, you wrote a follow-up, which I haven't had an opportunity to read yet. Uh, yes, and you can read both those stories. One is in, is in Town Hall, and the uh, you could probably just Google Town Hall Raquel Okiai, and you could find that story, the second story. Um, and Ted Tapier is a dad in from Connecticut. He's running for governor, by the way, uh. as an independent, I believe, um, in the state of Connecticut right now, currently. So it'd probably be easy to find him. It's Edward Tapier. Um, and... He came to me because he, 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 was, um, he was a dad, he was an engineer, he had an um, awesome job. I've been to his house, you know, beautiful home, beautiful family, two kids, a boy and a girl, wife, etc. Wife decides that she wants to get a divorce. Okay, what are you going to do? You know, things happen. It's not the end of the world, life goes on, right? Life goes on, mom and dad maybe separately, but you know, the kids still have mom and dad in, the, in a perfect world. Uh, mom decided that she didn't want dad to, decided that she wanted to alienate children from dad. You know, and this goes on a lot too, yeah. unfortunately, which is very sad because it doesn't help the kids. Um, and because he was a, um, um, basically an amateur gunsmith, gun collector, um, he had uh, quite a few firearms, firearms that in fact, his ex-wife's father gave him as a gift, as a wedding gift. You know, he has a collection of firearms. None, he had never been accused of using them unlawfully. They were, of course, all legal guns purchased legally with a background check. He's never ever been arrested in his life. He's never even had a traffic ticket, Ted Top here. And making, you know, three figures um, and really on top of his game, really on top of his game. And instead of ex-wife, you know, basically wanting, you know, doing a 50-50, which I think would be normal in those cases. No, she wanted to bury him. So she, she said that the guns, that the guns in the house were making her scared. And that's all it took for, um, for a SWAT team, a SWAT team uh, to, um, Surprise him home, gate, and I think there were about that was since we have for five years. Son's back. Currently, he's currently the rest because of his fight. Why isn't him okay? Okay, so just going back for a second. So Ted Tapier, who was a gunsmith, amateur gunsmith and collector, he, uh, his wife complained to the family court that she felt uncomfortable about his guns and that, they, that it was unsafe. And that's all it took, Bill, for a SWAT team, armed SWAT team, to scare the crap out of him, come into his home and confiscate all of his firearms, which to this date, Bill, he has not got returned. And in fact, they have accused, they have, in my opinion, unlawfully um, accused him of things without any evidence or, or proof. And he's, he's serving like a life sentence in his home because he's under house arrest with ankle bracelets. And this is all due to his ex-wife complaining about his firearms, which, which he was never involved in a crime. He was never arrested. He's never even got a traffic violation. But all it take, to, takes in America is one complaint, and, and it's only in a complaint. It doesn't have to even have any proof attached to it. And 14, 15 SWAT members, armed, gear, could you imagine being home? And a SWAT team coming in, you're home, that's scary. Yeah. And so he was proven guilty um, 
before innocent, uh, just the opposite of what our uh, rights are. And uh, it was fantastic that you stood up for him and, uh, and wrote the articles. So, and now uh, you said he's uh, actually running for governor of Connecticut? He is. He is. He wants to change the corruption in the family court. So he's become very vocal and um, he, kind of, he wants to hold people accountable. Don't we all? Destroyed. He can't even work. He can't work he's under house arrest. Could you imagine? You know, he's making six figures a year as, um, you know, on Wall Street, quite frankly. Very intelligent man. Um, a, a couple of degrees, you know, and, um, you know, kind of like they had the perfect life. They had the perfect life. And, you know, if wifey decides that she doesn't want to be with hub hubby, I, okay. You know, like I really don't hold that against people. Sometimes things don't work out. But where they go wrong is, is that somehow they believe, in the, believe that the children aren't entitled to both the parents. And that I don't understand. You know, I was a divorced mother. I had two sons with my first husband. You know, at, the, at that time, um, no, I didn't want to be married to him anymore. But I did never called myself a single mother. You want to know why? Because I wasn't. I was a divorced mother. And my children, my sons, had a father. And, you know, they don't need me to tell them, he does this, he did this. He, you know what? I took a step back and I said, let that, they can judge for themselves whatever they want. But my ex-husband loves them, his boys. That I know. Those are his boys. He loves them. I'm not going to take that away from him. And we made it, we, we hired one lawyer. We ironed out an agreement that was workable for both of us. And we moved on. My, my both sons are adults. My younger son, he lives with my ex-husband right now, you know, in New York. I mean, him and I don't talk and we don't have to, but my boys have a dad and I, you know, and I, Okay. They had a dad and a, no one was going to take their father's place. Nobody could take their place. And it would be up to them to decide whether, you know, whatever their opinion was of him, that would be up to them. Of course, they love their father. Is he perfect? No. Am I perfect? No. But we had an amicable relationship and it was the best that I could do for my boys. And um, I was only 25 years old and I knew better. I knew better. I, I, I hired one lawyer and we ironed out this agreement. The kids lived with me. He took them on the weekends. He went on vacation with them. He took them to practice and baseball and you know, all of that good stuff. And it gave me a break, gave me a break too. And I, and I, look, at other, I look at other mothers, because it, it, a lot of times it's mothers alienating you know their ch children from the dad and i'm so it makes me so sad i you know it's so hurtful to the kids and yeah. i you know I'm, I, I i my dad is deceased but you know i love my dad i love my dad to like to death he's like he's, he's the smartest man i know and i everything 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 that i am is because of my father so in my mind was you just you can't take that away from your own children. You can't take that away from your own children. So that's one of the reasons why, Bill, that I do do some, some of my work has to do, a lot of my work has to do with parental rights as well. Because it's this idea that parents, uh, children rather, are entitled to have both of their parents, whether they're divorced or not. It doesn't matter. They're still entitled to have both their parents. I agree, and you're a natural advocate. There's no question about it. Let's um, let's change to another thing that you're an advocate for. And <clears throat> pardon me, I'm going to read something to you. A well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state, the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. You know, a lot of people don't know that what that is. That's that's uh, the uh, Second Amendment in my uh, new book that's yet to be published. 
I have a chapter on the Second Amendment that I call the Sacred Second, because I'm afraid that we've got something going on in this country that's trying to take the Second Amendment away from us. I've even heard uh, politicians and pundits talking about we need to repeal the Second Amendment. And I was wondering uh, what your thoughts on that were. Yeah, they are out there. And I, I don't, um, you know, gun banning is really a control issue. Um, it, it, in history, we've seen that in other, in other tyrannical governments. Um, for instance, in Germany, um, Hitler uh, took, you know, disarmed the Jews. Uh, that was, he had to. Uh, because simply, you know, law enforcement starts banging on doors, taking, taking your family and putting them in carts. People are going to start shooting you up, <laughs> you know. Mm-hmm. I mean, sooner or later, you're going to get shot up. Uh, so that, that, it's sort of the whole idea. Um, and so they had to disarm the Jews in order to, to capture them. And that's exactly what they did. So it's just one example. So there's been other despotic governments in history uh, that have tried to take away people's ability to be armed. For me, the Second Amendment is a natural right. It's a God-given right to defend yourself. And I don't think that, I, I'm not really happy with any gun laws, quite frankly, uh, because, you know, I'm sure you'll agree with me, you know, guns, aren't the culprit, you know, guns don't kill people. We have 300 million guns at least in circulation in this country. If we were the problem, the, law, the law-abiding citizens who own guns, if we were the problem, we'd be in deep crap right now uh, because we have 300, 300 million guns in, so, uh, guns in circulation. You simply just can't control that and why would you? Uh, the only thing that can A famous statement. Yeah, I should have put my phone on airplane mode because <laughs> I'm getting because of phone calls. I apologize for that. No, no problem. No, no problem. You want to start up again? No, I'm. Go ahead. Still- we're, we're on. <laughs> so, uh, the only thing that can stop, uh, um, and this is all. The only thing that can stop a bad guy with a gun is a good guy with a gun. Mm-hmm. It's somebody who can defend themselves. Um, and this is not just me saying it. Um, this, is, this is study, study after study after study after study. Evidence, empirical evidence has shown that when you have a very strict gun control laws, you have very high violent crime rates. And then the opposite is true. So when you have very lax, when you have no or lax gun control laws, you have, you have a safe society. Um, that is because if you are a criminal mind, you break the law anyway. If you want to shoot up somewhere, a school, um, a courthouse, you know, whatever, whatever it is, you are a criminal mind. And most of the times, Bill, the evidence shows that criminals get their guns through the black market in the majority of the cases. Yes. You know, it's like 99% yes. of the times they're getting those, they're purchasing those firearms in the black market. I don't think people understand that we are very heavily regulated already. So people say, we need background checks. Well, we got that already. Yeah, we need this. Well, we got that already. We need the, we-, we got that already. They don't understand. We already have all of these gun, federal, federal gun control laws that tell us that, you know, we have, you know, since 19, what is it? Um, 1962, um, the, the federal, um, the um, Gun Control Act of 19, I want to say 62, I might be off a couple of years. In that law, Congress said, um, everybody who you want to apply, you have to get have a, a background check. I don't know. I go to buy a gun. I get, I'm on a background check. I don't know about you, but I know that that happens, right? Mm-hmm. I go buy a gun, I do a background check. I mean, that, that's the law. It's a federal law. Um, um, you, you have to have a license to sell guns, okay? In order for you to have that license, the procedures that go in effect that, to follow the law are very, very strict. So none of this is easy. So people think that, you know, these criminals, uh, they walk into a gun shop and they just buy a lot of, of firearms and they walk out scot-free and that there's no... There's not, no paperwork, there's no background check, there's nothing. It's simply not true. It's simply not that easy to, to purchase a firearm. And I think that that's you know, unconstitutional because a firearm is just like any other product. And, the, and, the, and the, the state really is not in any position to regulate products 
um, in that sense. Um, <clears throat> You know, it's just usurpation. It's usurpation of the government. They just want to control you. And the politicians who, who shoot, you know, want, who, they falsely say that gun control creates safety, but there is, app, there is zero, it's zero evidence to show that that is the case. And I just want to uh, mention at least one author, uh, Dr. John Lott. Dr. John Lott is a um, renowned, um, economist, expert economist, um, who I've interviewed quite a few times for my stories. And um, he's wrote quite a, about 14 books on, on gun laws. Now, what he told me when I first met him a long time ago in, at the New York City Young Republican Club, when he came as a speaker, he, told, he gave us a little talk. And uh, he told us that when he got into, he was already an economist, a doctor, PhD. And when he started writing, uh, doing research about guns, it was with the mindset that gun control works. Okay. It, he didn't go into it as a gun advocate. He went into it thinking that I, we have to figure out how we can control these guns because too many people are getting hurt. So during his research, he realized, he, oh my goodness, I was wrong. Gun control does not keep us safe. It's actually the opposite. Mm -hmm. And he proved to be a very good, you know, he still is a very, really good um, advocate for, for gun rights. Uh, but in, and he's, he's absolutely brilliant, brilliant. And his research is just, like, he doesn't miss a beat, this guy. He's so on top of it. In fact, he's taken some of, because Bloomberg comes out with his research, right? And it's so, and, and, and what John, Dr. Lott has done is he's gone back and looked at the actual backup of Bloomberg's research and has figured out that it has been skewed to the number that they want. Okay, so now the Bloomberg people, they push out their skewed numbers and then the gun banners just scream it from the rooftop without really understanding that the evidence, the evidence is very clear. It's very clear, and it says that an armed society is a polite society. An armed society acts as a deterrent against criminals. If we take away guns from the American people, the only people that are gonna be armed are the police and the criminals, and that leaves the rest of us sitting ducks. Yes, I don't it want does. Yes, it does. All these uh, things that take, take place uh, always take always place in uh, gun-free gun zones. That's another issue. Gun-free zones do not keep us safe. Uh, that is another topic that has been researched, and it, in fact, has been researched by the by the UN, um, who's also come to the cl same conclusion. Okay, it's not just John Lott. It's not just me. It's not just the gun advocates. It is the evidence. Gun-free zones actually uh, keep us less safe. Mm -hmm. Study after study, and this is why you don't have to. You don't have to like guns, Bill, and you don't have to carry if you don't want to. Nobody's forcing you to carry a gun. But I know if I go to a public place in the state of Florida, I know that the state of Florida has fifty percent of us are concealed carry permit holders. I know if I'm in a space with about 100 people, I know somebody's armed. Somebody is armed. And that's good enough for me. I don't even have to be armed. Just the idea that somebody is armed, I know that I'm protected because that armed person is acts as a deterrent. Criminals do not want to get caught. They want to do the most damage in the quickest amount of time. And gun-free zones allow the criminals to do that. I agree. I agree. And typically, and most typically criminals most are pretty, pretty, are pretty uh, much powered uh, anyway, power so they're not going to go into any kind of an, an area where, there's, where, there's, where the people are armed. What's happened now is even, even our uh, military bases are now, uh, gun-free zones, they're not allowed to carry guns. When I was an officer in the Marine Corps, I was responsible for classified material. 
whenever I handled and transported classified material, I had my 45 loaded, <laughs> you know, strapped on me. And uh, there was nobody ever going to get it. And the whole, this whole thing has gotten completely out of control and is completely misunderstood. And the uh, mainstream media, which I call the shady stream media in my articles, they, uh, you know, they're, they're bound and determined to take our guns away from us. And uh, being a con uh, not being a conspiracy theorist, but I have a conspiracy theory on this, is the end result is they want to socialize America. And the best way to do that is if we can start taking guns away from people, it'll be just like Germany in the 30s or like uh, Russia in uh, 1918. Take, take away our arms, and then pretty soon we have no way to uh, defend ourselves. And that's right. And, and really, and I, I know you understand this point, and I don't know that a lot of Americans understand this point, uh, but the Declaration of Independence, and uh, it was written um, to say that we, we, we are taking over, you know, tyranny from the British government in the American Revolution. So there was surely moving forward. We didn't want the, the patriots, the Amer first American patriots, they didn't want to be in a position where if the government stopped abiding by the Constitution and beca became despotic, they wanted to be in a position to overthrow the government. And the only way to do that is to be armed. And it is to be armed in the same manner that the government is armed. So, uh, and that's another thing I write about and talk about is our founders, um, they wrote the Declaration of Independence, not the Declaration of Dependence. And what we're becoming is a dependent country on the uh, federal government. And they want to take our rights away from us. And uh, they're, they're really working hard at it. And uh, we're not going to let them do it. So uh, we need to uh, remind everybody. And that's why I wanted to read the Second Amendment. We need to remind everyone. You have to know the Constitution and the Bill of Rights and the Declaration of Independence to really understand what we have in this country that's for us as opposed to what the government wants to do to us. Right, right. And so it's like Ronald Reagan said, I'm here from the government. No, you know, knock, knock, knock. I'm from the government. I'm here to help. Uh, yeah. <laughs> We're not here to help, you know, you, we're free. We, we were free to make bad decisions, good decisions, you know what I mean? And you're, you have to be held for your own actions. Okay. And that's being free. That is what it means to be free. You, you, you make your own decisions, bad, good, or ugly, but they're my decisions and I'm held accountable to them. Um, yeah, this, the whole gun banners, I, I just think that they're out of this world. I don't think that they actually look at the evidence. They're not really looking at the facts. They're really looking at controlling uh, the American people. And also, and I agree with you, and it, it is to produce a you know, socialist society that completely 100% dependent on the government. And say, kiss goodbye our freedom. Kiss goodbye. Okay. And, and speaking of kissing goodbye our freedom, I guess our time is just about up. So I guess we'll have to... Uh, say uh, goodbye to all of our viewers and uh, and there, there's an article that this is with so everybody will be able to find your uh, information and everything so uh, I like to end up my uh, show with uh, God God bless you all for viewing God bless America and God save our country because God save our America because we need you now more than ever before <laughs>